Hungry Trilobite Podcast would like to start by acknowledging these fine conventions. SoonerCon, Central Oklahoma's longest-running pop culture convention, is back. SoonerCon 31 is scheduled for June 30th through July 2nd, 2023, in Norman, Oklahoma. It promises a weekend full of tabletop gaming, cosplay, and appreciation for literary sci-fi as well as TV and comics. Visit SoonerCon.com for more information. The Hellmouth Convention The Hellmouth Convention is designed by fans for fans, with the aim of harnessing the power of fandom to raise money for charities. The Hellmouth Convention celebrates all fandoms, but particularly things like Buffy, Firefly, and Dr. Horrible. Like the Hellmouth itself, things gravitate toward it that you may not find anywhere else. The next event is scheduled for June 9th through 11th, 2023, in Los Angeles, California. On tap today, we have Janine Michaelis. How have you been? I've been good. How are you, Aaron? Doing fantastic. You were a finalist in the Sci-Fi Coffee Company's Creative Writing Contest, the Coffeeless Creatives Contest, with your short story, Papaja Dream. Yes. Congratulations on that. Thank you so much. So how did you come up with this concept? Yeah, so um, so my story is kind of a um, strange romance, and it starts in a therapist's office and kind of goes from there. Um, so I, and and to be quite frank, so I heard about this contest the Friday before it was due. It was due on a Sunday. <laughs> so um, so I kind of you know, quickly, quickly went through the materials. There was a prompt for me that was intergalactic romance. Um, There was a choice between, I think it was morning liftoff and intergalactic romance. So I went and I read about the coffee. I looked at the, actually like for for our viewing audience, um, there's a little image um, on the coffee of a man the outline of a man and an alien (laughs) so I was like okay so it's like some kind of interspecies romance and then I read just about the coffee and read that it came from Brazil so that's kind of how I got started and then I I wondered what was really interesting about coffee how could how could that be interesting and I thought well um coffee coffee keeps us awake right but what if there was a coffee so powerful that it could wake you from a very deep sleep. So that's kind of how I got the idea. And of course, um, the therapist office setting at the beginning, I thought was just hilarious and rich fodder for kind of misunderstanding and the hilarity of that. I said on an earlier episode that when we heard that the intergalactic romance was going to be a, a prompt, I was expecting a lot of variations on the old Taster's Choice commercials. <laughs> and I'm not saying that didn't happen. And I thought those weren't very good stories in their own right. But I love the fact that you took that kind of con- the obvious and flipped it on his head and went for the least obvious potential angle because it worked very well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. And I, that's kind of my style. I kind of, I remember just kind of jotting notes down in my notebook as I was doing chores and cleaning and, um, and then, but when I write, I usually don't quite know where I'm going or where it's going to end up. Um, But sometimes it kind of comes together and I feel like it kind of did. So. I would agree. And I'm not going to give away any part of the story because I'm not in the business of doing spoilers. Sure. But obviously it's going to be linked in the show notes so people will have access to it. So when it comes to your writing career, what is, is this something that's, that's indicative of what you want to do in general? Yeah, um, absolutely. So, and this contest meant so much to me. Um, ben E, who's associated with Sci-Fi Coffee, um, I've told him thank you so many times, but I don't think he really understands what this means to me. So I, I have always, I've been writing, you know, ever since I was small. Um, I've read books ever since I could. I read books before I could read. I would um, uh, just open a book. My parents called it preaching. I would just like talk and hold the book. Um, So I've just, I've always been a bookworm. 
Um, I was raised very sheltered, so I didn't always have access to um, all of the wonderful rich world of sci-fi that most people have access to, but I did have access to books. Um, and, you know, Ray Bradbury, um, huge fan, Kurt Vonnegut, um, Octavia Butler, et cetera. So I've always been in love with reading and writing, and it's always been something I've wanted to do. And um, I took a break about five years ago. There was a lot going on in my life. Um, I just kind of had to hit pause and, uh, you know, do self-care, go back to the basics. And that was really um, frustrating, really tough, but I just learned to wait. Um, and this, this contest was the first time I actually finished something in five years. So it really, it meant a lot to me. I really see where you're coming from there. And when it comes to writing, I, and almost everybody will say, you've got to sit down, you've got to write, you've got to do it. Um, a lot of my great writing heroes have said that, and they are a hundred percent right. But I'm also a big advocate of, you need to understand the reality of your life. And when life calls you to take that pause, you don't have to fight it. You just have to plan around it. You have to plan for when you're coming back. Absolutely. And I did, of course I did fight it. <laughs> I did fight it at first and I did, you know, um, people give you advice, like, you know, just keep, just keep journaling, just keep journaling. And I would do that. And, um, but realize that, realize that it just wasn't, it wasn't there, you know, my, that state of flow and state of creativity wasn't there and that that was okay. And that, at some point, I just learned to to wait. Mm -hmm. and, and if you can keep journaling, bravo for you. Uh, it, it's not a bad thing. And, and if you can find an hour a week, if you can find an hour a day, these are all good things. But there are times life will get in the way and you just have to be able to say, okay, I will pick a point at which I will say it's okay to come back to this and I'll do it. And I caution you not to get too far away from it. But life is what it is the you know if you have a, a death in the family or a, a job crisis situation you can't just say well my story is going to have to take it's not the world absolutely absolutely and learning to you know for me learning to listen to myself and what I need um you know um advice is wonderful when it's wonderful <laughs> Um, and advice comes from a place, you know, people are just telling you what works for them. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes that applies and sometimes it doesn't. So just learning to, you know, um, take some advice and leave most of it and just do what works for me. Um, and that was, that was definitely a journey. Yeah. That's something that I think 21st century creatives really need to understand is that the, I see so many people because I write, I podcast, I do independent film, I all these areas I touch on and that we have the same problem in each one of them. People will come in and say, what's the right way to do this? And there isn't one. People will give you advice because that's what's right for them. But you need to understand what they tell you may be great for them and nonsense for you. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So I don't want to get into, you know, getting too deep into what you're looking for, what you're looking to do. No spoilers. You're still working on stuff, but do you have ambitions specifically as to a place you'd like to go with your writing? I do. Um, so I, and this was interesting for me too, because I haven't quite thought of myself as a sci-fi writer, um, but this kind of shown a light on that a little bit and um so and Dan and I uh Dan who won first place right um actually did go to Indianapolis for um the uh I don't know what to call it ceremony excitement award acceptance um and coffee launch for the Kurt Vonnegut Museum and Library um and I was struck by how fun those people are like the sci-fi fans are just fun fun loving it was a very joyful place a joyful room um I coming at this writing thing kind of from a more cerebral academic mainstream place um, I remember going to uh AWP in 2014 the writers conference and the 
whole atmosphere was really heavy, <laughs> really, really desperate and really heavy. Like there's uh, this feeling of scarcity, like there's only so much room for success here. So um, it just felt, it did not feel um, creatively wholesome or um, encouraging. So I, you know, in, in Indianapolis, I was like, maybe these sci-fi people are my people. And I, I love sci-fi when I look at my favorite books, you know, and my favorite authors, um, that's definitely where it's at for me. So I'm kind of excited, encouraged by that. I do, I do want to write books. I do have, um, a novel. I have two novel drafts. One is, one is a sci-fi novel. It is terrible. I think it might be permanently up on blocks. <laughs> Uh, certainly I can scavenge it for parts for something else. Um, and I have another novel draft that I don't think of as a sci-fi novel. It's um, it's kind of a love triangle. However, it is set about um, 40, 50 years in the future in kind of a dystopian um, Pacific Northwest future. And it's very subtle, um, but I kind of like enjoy the subtle dystopia because I think it's um, maybe a little bit close to reality and kind of imagining um, what what will be wrong and what will be slightly better so that's interesting that you say you don't think of it as sci-fi because there are a lot of things I, I tend to play in and as stories I've seen that they're labeled as sci-fi because they have maybe one aspect that's different from our reality, but it's a very subtle aspect that just serves to move the story along. It's not necessarily an attempt to hinge the entire plot on, on science or on an alternate reality. And I just wonder if there are may, maybe a subtler spectrum of, of possible stories between pure fiction, contemporary fiction, and science fiction. I think so. Um, and when I, you know, Ray, Ray Bradbury, I'm reading the Martian Chronicles right now. Um, so like, so good. So good. And I love that book. Uh, um, and really just. It's almost like the sci fi is interchangeable. You know, Mars is just kind of the backdrop and the set for you know, all, all he needed was a world and another world. <laughs> and those could have been any two worlds. And it's really the thing that drives it and the power of it is um, story and people and what if, you know, so kind of those universal things um, make it so powerful. But um, I love, I love his style. Um, and I was even thinking about some of my other favorite writers. I don't know if you're familiar with Octavia Butler, um, but she's, amazing amazing sci-fi writer and she um again it's kind of the same thing it's really character driven and she asks a huge what if question um like in her book kindred it's like what if what if she herself were to go back to the antebellum south against her will how would she survive and how would that work um you know, so I think there's I think there's a lot of room if we let there be room and a lot of freedom. Octavia Butler is I know the name. I haven't read her work. She's very next on my list of people that I should have read a long time ago and need to correct that. How do you yes. feel about Anne McCaffrey? Not not familiar. Haven't read. OK, she's done quite a few things. Um, Dinosaur Planet is the one that I've read and had mixed feelings about, but I feel like I I. I, if I caught more of her stuff, I would probably appreciate it a little more. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll I'll read it. <laughs> yeah, like read it and get back to me. I'd like to have a conversation with you just about how you feel about it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, um, and even you know, I think in one of your episodes you were talking about Stephen King. You know, so even the horror genre. You know, like I see, um, I see lots of overlap. It's kind of this. Mm -hmm. Sci-fi is part of this larger ecosystem of imagination. Yeah, sci-fi, fantasy, and horror have far more in common than they have different. And I, I think the individual fans of each don't realize how much of a common bond they have sometimes. 
Right. Absolutely. I, yeah, I think but all of them, I, I just feel all of them. Um, I like the fans of all of them, you know, that joy I was talking about um, when you get a bunch of people in a room who love sci-fi or fantasy or horror or all three, <laughs> it's going to be a fun room. It is. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and I will give a shout out to the horror fans, not really calling one my, my I'm not one myself per se, but they are by far of those three, the most chill when it comes to just really having fun because they will find something that is absolute trash and they will find a reason to have a party over it. That is just the horror fan mentality. And I love that about them. <laughs> Absolutely, I do too. <laughs> and you had an event not too long ago, you're, you're getting into the con circuit? Oh, um, I, no, it was a, um, it was a local, it was a local writing conference. Oh, okay. A conference. So I, yes. So I went as an attendee um, and that was really, that was really interesting for me. I got a lot out of it. Um, it, so I, I live in um, Western Washington, kind of outside of Olympia, Washington, which is the, um, the capital um and i live a few miles out in more of a rural community so this was um at centralia community college um southwest washington writers conference it had a very strong um a very strong christian writing flavor to it the headliner keynote was jeff wheeler he's a fantasy author um he's doing amazing he's killing it he has um many bestsellers on amazon um so i got i had some great takeaways from him um and i was struck again i'm often struck by the kind of again this ecosystem overlap between um religion and fantasy and um he Jeff Wheeler is um, uh, Church of Latter-day Saints, I believe. Um, and, and it made me think of Brandon Sanderson and people, fantasy writers coming out of Utah. And anyway, so there was just, there was a lot going on in my brain. Um, I was myself, I was raised Seventh-day Adventist, very, um, very conservative um, religion with a large uh, rule playbook for how to live life. <laughs> so, um, in some ways I feel like that hurt my creativity in some ways I feel like it helped it. Um, but yes, I do see a lot of, and especially for Jeff Wheeler, um, he can use his, uh, religious background to help him in his creativity. He uses the, the stories from the Bible almost as like, mythology and he can build upon the symbolism and so it was really fascinating but um yeah certainly a very specific type of conference we had on a the gents from terminus media which is a, a comic book label that does a lot of those types of stories not exclusively but they will take stories from the bible and make sci-fi interpretations out of them and they do it extremely well. I absolutely love what they do. But moreover than that, I respect what they're trying to do. Because if you're coming from a place of faith, where you accept this as a truth in your life, it's very difficult to then make the transition to saying, but I'm also going to use this, this story that I accept as truth to tell a fantasy story that I'm acknowledging as fantasy. You're trying to play absolutely. the two sides of your brain. And, and, and that's not easy. And no, I asked, no, yeah, it's not. For, no. If you're going to, if you want to critique the stories because you you don't like religion or you like it too much, I, I ask both of those people to say, hey, just respect what they're doing because this is a very creatively difficult thing. Absolutely. Um, and you need, you know, I think you need absolute creative freedom in whatever, in whatever you're going to take on. Um, so the religion thing is tough. It's tough for me. I remember my grandmother, I believe, would... Um, you know, you're talking about taking the truth and then being creative with it or lies versus truth. So she, and this might be mythology, but she would have those Reader's Digest books 
and she would tear out the fiction stories because they were not true, right? So, um, you know, so that kind of environment is just um, not conducive to creativity. However, um, I think because some of my roots are there, it really, books just became my salvation, you know, 100%. And to see, to connect with the world in that way and to see people claiming their freedom in that way was so important to me. Um, and I think drives my motivation to write now. I just think of that. I imagined in my head, like a little 14 year old girl somewhere um, and she can get books and she's, you know, she's, um, her world is limited, but she can get books and I'm kind of writing for that person. That's, I love that you have a specific person, not necessarily an individual, but a type of person in your mind that you want to deliver this to because one of the questions I do like to, to bring up is asking what you would say to somebody who's in the place you're at now or, or who wants to be where you are now. What would you say to encourage them? And I, I think you just said it. It's like, yeah, I, yeah, absolutely. Um, don't give up, trust yourself. And I, I would add to that if, if I could, that there's always, there's a little more time than you think there is. I mean, we can't put off these things, but practicing, reading, writing, adding more to, don't think that you have to have all the answers now because you'll never feel like you have all the answers. Absolutely. Absolutely. I cannot agree with you more. Um, you know, it's a, it's a journey and you can't, you can't control the journey, but you can stay curious. Um, and it's amazing, you know, looking back, it's amazing. Um, how far I've come and how that journey has developed. I think it's more interesting to read something by somebody who's curious than somebody who thinks they have all the answers. Yes, yes. So at the um, Kurt Vonnegut Museum and Library, I um, the event, our, our little um, writing award event was there. I went back for the museum tour and um, I was talking to Chris, who works there. And we were talking about Vonnegut, Kurt Vonnegut and what he means to us. Um, and we, we came to the conclusion, I think he was talking about Cat's Cradle and I was talking about Slaughterhouse-Five, but that um, Kurt did not really give any answers. <laughs> he just didn't shy away from asking the questions and from articulating the questions. And he, to me, he's a truth teller. He just kind of lays it out like it is with all its uncertainty and all its warts. And, um, you know, there are no, I, I did not find any answers in Slaughterhouse Five, but I did feel less alone. Um, yeah. You started to understand that there was somebody else at least asking the same questions or having the same problems. Right, right. Not not to put words in your mouth, but that's exactly what I just heard when you said that. Yes, yes, that's exactly it. So is there a certain book that really was formative to you that, that you, is basically the reason you said, I've got to start writing? Or was it just more of your lifestyle at that point in time? Sure. Um, that's a tricky one. I think there's, I think there's a handful there's a handful of books. Um, and I think um, maybe the first for me was The Brothers Karamaza by Dostoevsky. Um, and that was in that was in high school, you know, conservative Christian high school, but that that blew my mind. <laughs> um, and and everything kind of followed from there. So I can't really, you know, I can't really name one book, but um, he was the beginning. And then there are some really amazing um, writers like Dorothy Parker, Shirley Jackson, Octavia Butler, which I mentioned, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, women who were, I could imagine myself in their shoes. I could visualize myself being them, um, you know, being in the writing cave, I think um, they would, 
I've heard stories about Shirley Jackson. She's a, I call her domestic horror. <laughs> she was living in New England um, and she would have people over for dinner and they'd all be sitting around the dinner table. And then she'd just excuse herself and go upstairs and write and then like come back down. <laughs> so um, just, yes, feeling, feeling an affinity with the way they wrote, the stories they were telling and um, the fact that they, that they did it as women with um, crazy lives made it happen. You've talked a lot about, you mentioned some very heavy, well-esteemed names in this conversation. And we talked at the beginning a little bit about self-care and taking care of yourself. I have to ask what your idea of candy is when it comes to literary. What, what do you like to do just to get the, the brain to clear out a little bit? Are you a comic book fan? Or is there a, yeah. a, a trashy section in your, your book pile? I mean, to, what, what to you just feels good? I love, I love that question. I love that question. So again, my, um, I feel like my very cerebral background came from this small environment that I, that I grew up in and there's a right way to do things and a wrong way. To do. So, so yes, I have, I have grown quite a bit and I do, um, like, first of all, I love, I adore, Fifty Shades of Grey. I think it's amazing. I adore Twilight. Twilight is um, like crack for my brain. It's amazing. Um, also, I've been introduced to um, Tank Girl, the comic book by one of my friends. Are you familiar? Um, I'm so, one of your friends. Uh, it's a comic book called Tank Girl. Oh, I'm familiar with the comic. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that, that has been amazing too. And that really, um, turned something on in my brain in terms of there's such a, there's such a comedy and a freedom with Tank Girl and also this underlying kind of unspoken trauma, or that's how I, that's how I see it anyway. But it was a it was a light bulb for me of um, how you can how you can express um, difficult things through through just comedy and um, the yeah the the dark comedy and the fun and the freedom in those comic books I really I really love it. But, I, I love that you're saying that I just in the past year started reading Red Sonia just mm -hmm. because I was I said to myself I want to get out of my comfort zone of spandex superheroes uh, as much as I love them I know there's so much else on this shelf that I'm not touching and it just appealed to me so mm -hmm. I said I'm and then I got the exact same experience it's like this is there's a comedy over something that's traumatic and I that's speaking to me at this point in time but I asked that because to me this is really important I, I, was, I love that you're so well read. I love hearing your insights on these legendary books. But I, when I say that the comic books are trashy or silly, that's not a bad thing. That just shows to me that it's like the, the lubrication in the heavier ideas. It's what gets your brain moving. And I, you're a perfect yes. example of that. Yes. So, and I, you know, um, feeling stuck um, after five years of not writing <laughs> is a very real thing. And part of, part of, Tank Girl, part of the the trashy books, it's it's getting back to a place of play. Um, you know, I was raised to be um, to not make mistakes, right? And that's that's not good for creativity at all. So just getting back to the fun, getting back to the play, and the things that just make you joyful and fall in love um, really inspire inspire ideas. And you need to be free to make mistakes, even if those mistakes make it all the way onto the shelf for somebody to see. And, and, and yes. I, I don't say that lightly. Uh, people yes. like, they're like, well, this movie was absolute crap and maybe it was, but you don't know until you put it in front of somebody and, and, and let them try it for themselves. And if you, if you second guess yourself, if you stop yourself, the world never gets that opportunity. Yes, which was another just really powerful thing with this writing contest for me. So I, 
I think the fact that I, I said I finished something, right? And that is me pushing through this perfectionist notion that if I can't, you know, if I can't write the perfect story or the perfect novel, then why, why even bother? Um, and just rejecting that and pushing through to the other side. I remember, <laughs> and because I wrote it, um, it almost felt like 24 hours because I wrote it in such a short amount of time. I didn't really have time for anyone to look at it or to edit it. I remember after sending it off, um, finding some typos. And so I was like, oh, I got to, you know, I got to reach out and email Ben before like before it gets anywhere. And then I was able to let go of that, you know, like maybe it's a good thing if there's a couple typos published, you know, and someone sees that and it could encourage them like, oh, hey, you know, it's not perfect, but I could do that. I've heard from a lot of editors that a few, a, a small number of typos is not a deal breaker. And, it, and a lot of people would think it would be, but really it just shows that you've got the bulk of it down. A few getting through shows that you put the polish into everything else. Mm -hmm. Not encouraging typos, just saying it's not what the, it's not the deal breaker people think it is. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And by writing it and sending it out in such a short period of time, you didn't give yourself a chance to let the anxiety build. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, it felt like it felt like a perfect creative storm <laughs> <laughs> where I, I was able to, it was the right environment and just a fun idea. Um, and I just played with it and sent it off. Well, Janine, I want to find your next creative storm. I'm looking forward to seeing the results of it. Where can people follow your uh, adventures on the internet? Sure. So I, um, I'm light on social media, but I am on Instagram. It is um, samson.michael.inc, I-N-C. Samson is the name of my dog. Um, so I will, I will post any, any new adventures there. Um, and you know, also, of course, check out the story on Sci-Fi Coffee and and just follow Sci-Fi Coffee. They do amazing things. I'm sure they'll be um, posting new and exciting contests and content. I'm going to put all that in the show notes on my website, AaronVosick.com. I just went ahead and followed you on Instagram. So looking forward to recommending anybody else do that as well. Thank you so much for being here. I'd be glad to have you back anytime. Thank you so much, Aaron. I enjoyed speaking with you. I'd love to see you again.